invite you to pick up your pew Bibles and turn now to page 788. 788, this is Matthew chapter 7. And we are looking at verses 12 through 29. Listen now for the word of God. In everything, do to others as you would have them do to you. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the road is easy that leads to destruction. And there are many who take it, for the gate is narrow, and the road is hard that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You know them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorns or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many deeds of power in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you evildoers. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell. The floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like the foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Now when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as their scribes. The word of the Lord. It was February 1st, 2015, And Super Bowl 49 was underway. This was at the University of Phoenix Stadium in front of about 70,000 raucous fans and another 115 million people watching on television, making it the most watched Super Bowl of all time. And at the game, the Seattle Seahawks head coach, Pete Carroll, made a decision that will be remembered in sports history for decades. With 26 seconds left in the game and the Seahawks down by four and on the New England Patriots one yard line, Pete Carroll made a call. Instead of handing the ball to the running back, Marshall Marshall Lynch, who was probably the best running back at the time, Carroll called a passing play on the second down and the Patriots intercepted And the game was over. And here were some of the headlines. The worst play call in NFL history. The dumbest call in Super Bowl history. And this one, a terrible Super Bowl mistake. Pete Carroll wasn't having any of it. He did not agree with any of this Monday morning uh, quarterbacking. He believed it was the right call based on the numbers and his experience. But no one will dispute the fact that the play didn't work. So a more interesting question for me has always been this. What did Carroll do next? How did he respond to this brutal media onslaught? Well, in short, he owned it. He said to the guys in the locker room, it's my fault. It's totally my fault. 
And when he had a chance to throw his offensive coordinator under the bus, he refused. And he said with confidence, I made the decision. I did it. And isn't that what good leaders do? Isn't that what we expect of a good leader? Is to own a mistake, to own a decision that they make, even when it's a decision that goes well or it goes poorly. Isn't that what we expect of our leaders? There's an old saying, no one is a failure until they blame somebody else. And we know a good leader by the fruit that they produce. They own it. They own their decisions. And by doing so, they can decide how the next part of the story will be written. Well, today we conclude our sermon series on the greatest sermon that was ever preached. And several weeks ago, I joked that sermon was not preached here in this pulpit. In fact, it's not been preached anywhere in this country or anywhere in Europe or anywhere in Australia, the greatest sermon ever preached was on a grassy hillside on the the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And subjects that were covered in that sermon ranged from authenticity, loving your enemies, being the salt, being the light, living, becoming the Beatitudes. The Sermon on the Mount gets to the heart of our motivation, pure and simple. You have heard it said, but I tell you. In other words, when do we keep God's rules but close our eyes to God's intent? That is the Sermon on the Mount. And take the golden rule, for instance. We just heard it. In many religions, it's stated negatively. You hear it this way. Don't do to others what you don't want done to you. But Jesus puts a positive spin on this. He makes it more significant. It, it, it isn't usually very hard to refrain from harming others. It's much more difficult to take the initiative to consistently do good to them. The golden rule, as Jesus formulated it, is the foundation of active goodness and mercy. The kind of love God shows us each and every day. Us, who are undeserving, each and every day, God pours out one blessing right after another, as we've already heard from David Hooker in this morning's welcome. And so the rest of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is about the choices that we make. And each has two distinct options. We heard the narrow gate and the broad gate. Which one will we walk through? Then there's the good tree and the bad tree. What kind of fruit will we produce? And then there's true discipleship versus false discipleship. What what kind of a commitment are we willing to make? And then there's the solid rock foundation versus the sandy, shaky foundation. Which foundation will we build our, our life upon? And all of these are important decisions that we must make in this life. It's one thing to preach a sermon... It's, it's an entirely different thing to preach a sermon and then say, what are you going to do about it now? Right? Where do you go from here? How will you live your life? What does this all mean? How are you changing? For example, the kind of fruit that we produce. Now, Willa Brown read for us Psalm 1. What did we read? About the person who does not follow the advice of the wicked. They are like trees planted by streams of water which yield their fruit in its season and their leaves do not wither. In all they do, they prosper. Now that is a vision that we can sink our teeth into. That is something I can subscribe to. What about you? Today, there are so many false prophets walking our streets, and they remain with us. Their words sound religious, but they are simply motivated by power, fame, sex, and money. It's so obvious. They minimize Jesus, and when I say they minimize him, they have very little to do with his life, 
his teachings, his miracles, his death, his resurrection, and ascension. In fact, they very rarely mention it. More often than not, they spend much of their time teaching and preaching to glorify themselves. We know these leaders by the fruit they produce. Their preaching is not centered on Christ, nor does it call anyone to repentance. Rather, it's all about how you can become rich and prosperous. As I've mentioned, there are preachers who love to, you know, smile at you and tell you if you just do these six things, you can have your best life right now. But is it that simple? I don't know. A true prophet would declare God's will to God's people. A true prophet would feel the passion, the compassion, the the very heart of God for God's people and then reveal that to God's people and call for repentance, call for change. But false prophets, well, they would just have us buy their empty promises. They look good, they, they sound good, they're beautiful, they wear nice clothes, but they are really wolves in, in sheep's clothing. Speaking of wolves, some of us in this room remember the name uh, Glenn Scotty Wolf. Glenn Scotty Wolf, anybody remember this name? He was a flamboyant, Bible thumping fundamentalist minister, and he claimed to believe all of the orthodox doctrines of the church. He never said a word against Jesus, and he literally preached the word of God brilliantly. But there was only one problem. For 35 years, this so called minister held the Guinness Book of World Records as the most married man in the world. Glenn Scotty Wolf took 29 trips down the aisle. I know, I know. You're thinking, how in the world does somebody get married that, that often? Well, he, he said, he said it's because he was against living in sin. But even though the Bible does address divorce and it has a lot to say about it, he divorced one of his wives for eating sunflower seeds in bed. He divorced another wife because she used his toothbrush. One marriage lasted 19 days. The longest lasted seven years. He left behind 19 children, 40 grandchildren, and 19 great-grandchildren. And never once did he meet any of them. In Matthew 7.20 we read, Thus you will know them by their fruits. You will know them. Charles Spurgeon was 19th century pastor, and because of his clear and persuasive preaching, he became known as the Prince of Preachers. And in his own way, Spurgeon was much of a celebrity as some of the biggest names we know today, but his attitude was so much different. Spurgeon and his wife had a rather odd practice. They raised chickens. And they sold the eggs to family and friends. And many people tried to presume on his his generosity and asked for a discount, but he never gave in and he always sold them at a fair price. People thought him rather peculiar and rather parsimonious until after he died. They learned that Charles Spurgeon and his wife used the proceeds from their egg sales to support two elderly widows who had very limited income. It was the love of Christ that compelled them to find a practical way and a private way to care for these women. You know a tree by its fruit. An apple tree produces apples. An orange tree produces oranges. And a Christian should be someone who is producing Christ. Just as we asked ourselves last Sunday, what will you find when you pull the husk down off of your life? Now we have to ask, what comes out of our lives? We are called not to produce this fruit out of our own self-effort, but to grow deeper and deeper and deeper, to allow our roots 
to reach those minerals and the water table so that we will be fed and that we will produce, produce, produce good fruit, fruit that'll last. Just as trees are consistent in what they, they produce, the kind of fruit they produce, good teachers consistently exhibit good behavior, high moral character as they seek to live out the truths in Scripture. And all pastors and teachers and leaders in the church are held to a higher standard. This should be really said about all of us, I think. We should all be of the business of producing good fruit. But not that we don't have our shortcomings. Some of us here, we have to admit, we don't completely understand every passage of Scripture. Uh, We're going to be wrong at times about some of the things we endeavor to interpret. But even more so, that is why we should show the same grace to others as as we expect for ourselves. Today, Jesus is asking us, what kind of fruit are you producing? Are you bearing the fruits of anger, uh, bitterness, uh, small-mindedness? Or are you producing the fruits of love, of, of kindness, of justice? Many years ago, there was a a woman who, with great sincerity and dedication, led a vacation Bible school. You know when a church says, hey, let's do a VBS and you got to find the right leader. This woman said, I'll do it. I will do it. She was nervous, but she was willing to serve. Well, there was a a young boy who recently moved to the community, and he he began attending the vacation Bible school classes. And the teacher noticed that he only had one arm. So she tried her best to be sure that all of her comments and all of the activities that they would be about would not bring attention to what she called his disability. The focus that night was on the church, and without even thinking, she said, now let's all make our churches. She said, let's put our hands together like this, and let's use our index fingers for the steeple, and now the thumbs for the doors to the church, and And then she looked and she realized, oh my gosh, the thing that I hoped I wouldn't do, I I just did. And the boy was standing there awkwardly, obviously not able to participate. And so she froze. And that's when another boy in the class stood up and walked over and said, Joshua, take my hand. Let's make church together. I'd like to think that that little boy is not very far from the kingdom of God. And I'd like to think that each and every one of us who love Christ, who are doing his will, who are showing love to others, who are wisely building our homes on the rock of his life are as well. So like NFL coach Pete Carroll who refused to blame his offensive coordinator when he had the chance, we can say with confidence, you know what? I've listened to the whole sermon and I've made a decision. And I have decided that I'm going to commit my life to the one and only one who can help me bear the kind of fruit that makes a difference in this world. Let's pray. Our gracious God in heaven, we give you thanks for your word and for this sermon series. Whether we've read the Sermon on the Mount a hundred times or this is the first time we are hearing it, we pray that you will challenge us in such a way that these words will shape our lives 
and we will walk victoriously for you in a new way. And so God grant that the words we've just heard may through your grace be so grafted within our hearts that they bring forth in us the fruits of your Holy Spirit to the honor and praise of your most glorious name through Jesus Christ our Lord. And all God's people say, Amen.